So <clears throat> now I'm going to show a clip from a more recent film called Symphony of the Soil that I'm going to be talking about tomorrow, which also has to do with this whole idea of, of feeding the world and do we need, what do we need to feed the world. It was called the IAASTD, the International Assessment for the Role of Agricultural Science, Knowledge, and Technology in Development. And it was basically, what's the answer for world agriculture? And after a four-year process in 2008, the final report came out, and they basically said that the answer is not high-tech, it's uh, genetic engineering is not going to save agriculture, neither is nanotechnology or these high-tech solutions, but the answer is these more ecologically rational agroecology. Uh, the question is, can organic, uh, sustainable agroecology feed the world? Sure it can. And I know this because I was involved myself in a lot of research in Africa. We have quadrupled, I mean, up to even 10 times more yield, totally sustainable, organic actually, by doing the right thing and by building soil. So the yields go up year after year to reach levels which if every African farmer, let's say, would produce according to some of those systems, there will be plenty of food around for everybody. <laughs> but, there's a but here too, it doesn't fill the pockets of a few uh, business people. This helps the farmer and the consumer. And we have to widen this stem to make sure that there's more connections from farm to consumer and also more people in between. It's important because agriculture needs input output no matter what you do. Yeah, once a week we do a box of food that's done. So this IAASTD report he talks about, I think it was 70 countries uh, did four years of research, scientists from 70 countries. <coughs> they came up with this conclusion that Hans Herren talks about and the U.S., I think it was the U.S. and Canada were the only countries that didn't actually sign on to it. The U.S. didn't sign it because it didn't promote GMOs. There you go, our country, our, our government at work. <laughs> so um, that's, uh, then I'm just gonna wind up with, uh, with the end of the film. Uh, so this wasn't the whole film that you saw, it was basically clips from the film trying to tell you what has changed, but actually all their, their, one of the things that they talk about, let me think I've got another slide here with golden rice, they've been talking about for 20 years is they genetically engineer vitamin A into it, it's going to uh, uh, stop babies from going blind, and it actually doesn't work, it's not available. Um, and one of the things, most recently there were 100 and over 100 Nobel Prize winners. None of them had new, none of them's field of expertise had to do with food or agriculture or anything like that, said that if people were against golden rice, GMOs or golden rice, they're basically uh, committing a crime against humanity. This is, was actually, they would signed on to it. And one of the, the thing that they were most promoting is golden rice. It turns out golden rice does, it's not even available for farmers to test. It doesn't work. Um, and the reason why people would need this is because they're not eating a healthy diet. So this idea that you genetically engineer one vitamin into corn and then we provide it to them and it's patented, but if they're poor enough, they wouldn't have to pay the patent fee. You know, it, it's so insulting to these people and so insulting to, to their way of life. So, you know, if you grow a green, a, certain kinds of greens, you can actually get vitamin A. So what they really need is, uh, is their own farming systems instead of this sort of neo-colonial idea of coming in with this high-tech high thing and helping them. But it, in fact, aside from that, it, isn't, it hasn't worked. Uh, the test they did, they have to grow it, then they freeze it, and then they, they feed it to people and you need oil, you need oil to be able to actually bring, let the vitamin A work. So if they actually are going to use this, they're going to have to freeze it and then they're going to have to give them, you know, butter or oil to eat with it. And the whole, it doesn't make sense, but it's one of these uh, promotable items. You know, it's basically a big hype so that people will think, oh, we need this and if we're against it, we are committing a crime against humanity. I think I'm for it. I don't want to think about it anymore. Let's move on. 
But it's important to really research this. And every, they did the same thing with uh, virus-resistant cassava. They said, oh, this is going to save cassava in Africa. Didn't work. The same thing with sweet potato in Kenya. This was a big hype. You actually look at it, didn't work. But there are all kinds of, of, of ways that indigenous people, like the sweet potato thing, there's this system where you, you plant crops away from where you're growing the, the crop you're trying to grow, and it pulls the pests out to this, these other plants, and so they don't attack the plant that you want to save. So there are ways that people have used, and there's crops that they've used, and instead of respecting that and, and helping them live the way that they traditionally want to live, coming in with the Gates Foundation and, you know, our government comes in and basically wants to take it over. It's sort of a takeover technology. It's like a takeover bully. And I'm totally against it. So I think that we as Americans have a responsibility to really challenge this and to really keep informed about what is, uh, what's true, what's real, what's working. All right, on to something. First, the bad news, we then the good news. We have the of ending up with green deserts. <laughs> where you don't see the difference. You know, the environment will continue to be green, but it is being transformed from inside. And when that cracks, when that monoculture breaks down, it's going to be very massive. As we move into the future, what could we find on our supermarket shelves? particularly bad idea <laughs> didn't pan out. There are thousands of test sites for new GMOs in the United States. In 2002, the USDA condemned 50 million pounds of soybeans contaminated with GMO corn engineered to manufacture a pig vaccine. My biggest concern is we're merely going to go into the future believing that, you know, somehow the technologists are going to solve the food problem, then we're all going to be okay. And, uh, you know, we're going to have a very, very rude shock. The biotechnology industry, of course, is not simply interested in genetic engineered crops. We are seeing them trying to extend their reach throughout the rest of the living community. Right now, uh, our government is looking at approving genetically engineered fish, 15 different kinds of fish, as well Salmon's as crustaceans just about anything else that we eat out of the ocean. It is estimated that if just 60 genetically engineered salmon were released, the wild population of salmon could be extinct in 40 generations. Genetically engineered livestock and poultry, and also genetically engineered insects and trees. It is the industrial mindset now made the biology of our food. But something happened on the way to their future. People began to think about the consequences of our food system. And they said, you know what, we want a different food future. We want a different relationship to food, to the environment, to the farmer, to the worker, to our own bodies. What would it take to change the American food system to make farming sustainable and improve public health and environmental quality? What we're trying to do in sustainable agriculture is to use resources that are in the local ecology and recycle those resources within the system rather than taking resources from another system or another ecology and bring them in. And we should be using solar energy uh, to fuel our systems as nature does rather than relying on imported petroleum or other resources. A century ago, people bought locally produced food. Today, food in a supermarket has traveled an average of 1,500 miles. Apples were grown all over America. Now, they are shipped from China. This uses more imported oil 
and increases our dependency on other countries for food. The food from this farm travels an average of 50 miles. About 10 years ago, we started a program for Bay Area families where they can get a basket of our produce once a week. It's called Community Supported Agriculture. And our relationship with those families encouraged us to really diversify. And as a result, as you walk around this farm, you'll see that each field has many different things growing. There's fruits, nuts, citrus, there's grapes, as well as row crops like tomatoes and eggplant and corn. We've been farming organically for about 25 years. And because it is a system of farming where you are thinking about the human relationship to, to agriculture. You're thinking about primarily producing good food, food that you have no doubt about what, what character and quality it has, um, food that's healthy, that you have no doubt that my kids can eat. Um, and so we've looked for to evolve ourselves in a system that is diverse and healthy and uh, sustainable. We have to respect nature's logic in all of this. We have to respect the, the millenniums of history that have gone into breeding. This is the, the work of thousands of generations of people who have plucked the wild onion, you know, developed a little bigger one, chosen that over time. And it's not something anyone can say they own. In 1990, the U.S. government attempted to describe organic standards. After years of formulating the regulation, in 1997, it was revealed that the standards would allow irradiation, sewage sludge, and genetically modified organisms. The government received one of the largest consumer protests in history. 275,000 citizens wrote to the USDA, outraged by this, and demanded that organic standards be kept pure. The consumers prevailed. The underpinnings of my conversion to organics are not so much the economic point, it's the health point. To protect my health, protect my family's health, and my neighbors. Because if I'm the steward of my own land, that also means I'm responsible for what's happening outside of my little parameters, my fence line. Our Saskatchewan Organic Directorate has taken this position that organic farming is a real alternative to the farm crisis. There has been a revolution in genetic engineering, but there has also been a counter-revolution. People are returning to buying fresh produce grown by local farmers. Organic farming farmers markets and community supported agriculture are only three of the many alternatives to the industrialized food model. South Dakota and Nebraska, along with eight other states, have passed constitutional amendments or state legislation that ban non-family owned farming. When the corporation said, Nebraskans don't have the authority to ban we corporate persons from owning farmland, the Nebraska Supreme Court said, the Nebraskans can put whatever they want in their constitution. This is their fundamental right. It's the essence of the American democratic system. The consumer is still king. And the problem is that consumers can't act unless they have adequate information. So one of the things that we can all do is to get as much information as we can, to get that information into the hands of the public, uh, into the hands of consumers, so that consumers can continue to exercise their choice. Because the food system is fluid, it can change quickly based on the opinions of the public. But if genetically modified food is not labeled, how are consumers able to exercise their rights? The choices we make at the supermarket determine the future of food. Food is one of the most intimate things we do. <laughs> and if we don't have any choices about that, uh, I think that's a very troubling, uh, very troubling scenario. 
There are large groups of people in other countries that have never bought into the American model of chemical intensive large scale agriculture. And they certainly have not bought into the notion that the efficiencies that one gains by having two airline manufacturers in, in the world or four auto makers or two makers of software, they believe that whatever gains you, you might make in efficiency are lost because you lose diversity. Whether there's going to be any serious change or challenge to the bulk of the way that, that agricultural land gets managed and farm businesses are organized, I think that, that's an open question. And, and frankly, I don't think it will happen unless the American public um, and farmers themselves sort of stand up and say, wait a minute, we just don't want to go any further down this road. And, you know, we are a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. And, hey, we're the people. We don't want to go there. It's up to you. So, so thank you all. Um, it's a very contentious issue, and I think that as citizens, we need to speak out and vote with our dollars and let our representatives know what we want and don't want. So, um, thank you very much. Thank you.